welcome to this review of my Ciccone KB5162F Redux. This was the second Alps board I ever got after the Dell 8101 and it was the first keyboard the guys at the uni found for me. It appears to have sat in a cupboard for bleeding ages and thankfully it had a dust cover on it so it was in very nice clean condition. They did appear to have stored it with something on it because a couple of the switches had lost their click but thankfully you can open these switches without special tools or the need to desolder them and I managed to restore their click by re-bending the click leaf inside. In fact this is the very keyboard I used in the tutorial on how to maintain these switches. Speaking of which they used clicky white alps switches. Or rather, this one uses white alp switches because the 5161 is currently the keyboard that can come with the second highest amount of different switches that I know of. There's a blue alps version which was presumably the original one, but later ones could come with white alps, cherry mx blue, cherry mx clones, taiwan style white axis switches and even fatabas. So six different switch types, just one behind the focus 2001 which could come with seven. That we know of so far. Basically, if you bought Chaconi, you bought something. Anything. But at least they were cheap. Chaconi, who was considered a clone manufacturer at the time, made keyboards that cost much less than IBM Model M for example, and some of the switches this came with were at least on par with, or arguably better than the ones in the Model M. Others, however, were not. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? So about these white alp switches, they're the older pine version with slits, and because they've been only sparingly used and are still so clean, they feel pretty good. Like basically all alp switches, they make a great noise, and they use a fairly large metal clicker, which gives them a nice and deep click. Compare that to the plastic click jacket of clicky cherry switches, and it becomes obvious why alps sound so much better. Let me demonstrate the difference using a standard Cherry MX Blue G80 3000 keyboard. They have a nice crisp tactile feel but like the Model M they have a tactile force of about 70 grams so if you're used to MX Blues which are about 60 grams you might find them a little bit stiff at first. They're also a lot less robust than Cherry MX when it comes to wear and contamination. Basically if you find an old Cherry keyboard you'll know roughly what you can expect but Alps tend to feel really really shit unless the switches are quite pristinely clean and honestly you're missing out if the switches are anything but new old stock. Even this one, as clean and nice as it is, I can notice it. This sensitivity to condition is the single biggest disadvantage of ALP switches, even worse than the fact they're no longer made. That said, if you do find nice ALP switches, it's hard not to fall in love with them, I'd say. The board is fairly well built and bears a strong resemblance to the Alps Bigfoot platform which includes the Dell 8101, a very common keyboard, the most common Alps board out there in fact. Some other boards have roughly this shape as well but the 8101 is by far the most well known and widespread of them all. Apart from having the same dimensions it also has the same highly characteristic curved banana like shape of the 8101. Because of the large amount of keyboards with this shape, and worse, AT layout boards with a similar shape that came before it, it's hard to say which one was the original, but the Ciccone 5161's FCC ID was registered two years before the oldest version of the Dell 8101, the 3PV model, so of those two, the Ciccone was first at least. Like the Bigfoot, it uses a thick plastic case and a metal mounting plate so it's well built and it weighs roughly the same 1.4 kilos. It doesn't even flex that much but still it doesn't feel quite as taut as the Bigfoot somehow. Still, overall not bad. 
It's got very similar flip-out feet as well, and a coiled cable, but unlike the Bigfoot, it's got an AT plug instead of a PS2 one, and there's no cable gutter like there is on the AT101. And further, as you would expect, there's an AT-XT switch on the keyboard, which was a common feature at the time to preserve compatibility with all the computer systems that were still lingering around. Computers back then were expensive and made to last, and they made them last. The plastic chassis does influence the switch sound considerably. Compare the sound of this thing to that of an Omni key with White Alps, a keyboard with a taut, thick metal chassis and backplate in which weighs almost twice as much. There's a variety of small stickers at the back, including a very brief model sticker, an Opus brand label, and a test sticker from 1993. Now, that's slightly late for an ATXD keyboard, or Pine White Alps, so it could have been a general hardware test rather than a manufactured date, but I'm not sure. The layout is a slight variation of the modern 101 key layout. Nowadays, keyboards tend to use either an American-style ANSI Enter or a European-style ISO one, but many of these Asian clone keyboards of the time used a big-ass Enter, which is basically a combination of both. I suspect they did this to partly appease both ANSI and ISO users, as well as those who were still used to the AT layout, which was the standard before the Model M's 101 key one, and probably partly to make manufacturing slightly simpler and cheaper. I actually really like these big enter keys, but generally it came at a cost because the key that was displaced to make room for the enter key was usually put next to here, which results in a very short and awkward backspace, and it also kind of messes up the coordination of the number and symbol keys before it. Other than that, it's a standard layout though, so it's not too bad. The keycaps use a type of surface ink for the legends that Asian manufacturers appear to refer to as silkscreen printing which is a fancy term for stenciling. Originally, I couldn't really show you the details of this printing, but now that I have a proper camera and some micro filters, I can show you a bit better what I mean. The ink is slightly yet visibly raised out of the keycaps, and unlike dye sublimation, which sinks the ink into the caps, these legends are quite clearly on top of the cap surface. They're also fairly shiny, it's also theoretically possible that these legends are infilled, but that method is much more typically associated with dark keycaps, on which lasered legends don't stand out and therefore need a white filler material to make them legible. I don't really see why they would elect to use infilling on the caps that you can just use black ink on. Just like pad printing, this does give legends that are somewhat vulnerable to wear, but unlike pad printing, you get nicer and cleaner looking rimless legends, and they look pretty good actually. They are thin and made out of ABS though, and although these ones are nice and white because of the low amount of use they've seen, such keycaps can get really, really yellow eventually. Overall, you can tell this keyboard is really not up to the standard of an IBM Model M, which is built much better and has much better keycaps, not to mention having a better layout. That said, I consider White Alps to be just as good as Buckling Springs, if in mint condition, and Blue Alps to be even better, and if you can get the rarer A model, you get Enki Rollover on it too. It's hard to judge this now, but considering this was a fraction of the M's cost at the time, this wasn't that bad a buy really, or at least some of them were. <laughs> I wouldn't use the model with Mitsumi's even if you paid me to. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.